This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and what can I say? We've got Jerry Herman, so here to introduce him, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. We've been trying to get Jerry Herman here for uh, over a year now, and I'm just delighted he could be with us tonight on Theater Talk. Uh, Jerry, welcome. Thank you, and I'm equally delighted. Well, you I've know, been we, looking forward to this. We've been speaking on the phone so many times over the last couple of years as I write about you in my column for the Post all the time, and I'm always saying, Jerry, when you're in town, I want you to swing by and do our show. And I promised you that I, I would. <laughs> and you're here. Welcome. <laughs> uh, gosh, hello, Dolly, Mame, La Cajofol, Mac and Mabel, uh, Miss Spectacular, a new show you're working on uh, with Tommy Toon. Yes. For Las Vegas. By you're, the way, you really are the, the uh, godfather of that idea. You wrote about the fact that Tommy Toon and I would make a good collaboration. Mm -hmm. And we've met a couple of times, and it is great collaboration. Am I in the royalty pool? <laughs> you should be. <laughs> I don't say that. Want, Watch out. I wanted to tell you, uh, on the way over here today, I was, um, it's a true story, in the subway, and there was a young girl there whistling, I'll be wearing ribbons down my back. I oh. tried to collect a royalty for you, but I want to take her lunch money. <laughs> <laughs> but it occurred to me, there must be all over the place, people whistling a Jerry Herman tune, humming a Jerry Herman tune, singing a Jerry Herman tune. It's probably the most satisfying part of, 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 of what I do to get into a, a taxi and to hear a song of mine on the radio and have the taxi driver whistle along with it and not have the vaguest idea that the man who wrote it is sitting in the back. <laughs> I, I just sit there and grin and, <laughs> and there are a million experiences like that. Yeah. That, Where you are, it seems to me, really the heir to, um, to Irving Berlin in the musical theater. The two of you are the great tunesmiths of the American theater. Where does this gift for this melody that catches in everyone's mind the first time they hear it come from? Do you have any sense of how you come up with these gorgeous I, I, tunes? I honestly have not the vaguest idea because it's all in here and it was never studied, it was never anything that I went to school for. I went to school to learn how to be an architect and a, and a designer. Mm -hmm. And I started writing songs and my mother made me go and take those songs to Frank Lesser who she got an appointment with through, a, she didn't know him, but she had a hairdresser and a somebody, you know, it was one of those, uh, 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 I call it the Mother Mafia, <laughs> and, and uh, she made an appointment and actually f had to force me to go. Really? I said, I said he's going to laugh at me. I'm a kid. And how old were you? Oh, I must have been 17, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had these 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 songs that I thought were were cute, mm. but that's about the strongest adjective I could use uh, uh, about them. But she's, she, of course, being a mother, uh, wanted me <laughs> to show them to, to Frank. So I, I went, and he changed my life. He said, you've got to go to the musical He changed theater. my life in, in, in the course of about three hours. He kept me there all afternoon. Did he teach you something? Did he tell oh, you? What did he? he? He was such a mentor to me. He, that afternoon, he, he took out a, a, a he had a, a uh, pads of, of, of very long, like artist's paper on his desk, mm -hmm. and lots of colored uh, uh, crayons and, and, and markers. And he drew a freight train, and he drew a bright red caboose, and he said, the reason you know how to write songs instinctively is that you always have a caboose on your songs. And he said, never forget that. And he quoted his own, I'm going to get you on a slow boat to China, mm. all to myself alone. And he said, the all to myself alone doesn't come until that last moment and explains the song. And, and that's the caboose. And you know, I almost never write a song that doesn't have a, there'll be no blue Monday in your Sunday clothes, which is the, the that, capper yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. that's the or I won't send roses which goes through a whole litany of why this girl should stay away from him. And then the last line is, I won't send roses, 
and roses suit you so. Boom. Caboose. Boom. <laughs> That's the caboose of all time. <laughs> that, is a, that is a great so caboose. So he was a wonderful, wonderful influence in my life, and I'm eternally grateful to him and to my mother for sending me. Yeah, and when you were a kid, didn't your mother play the piano? Oh, my mother was a very talented lady who had her own radio show ah. before I was born. It was called Ruth Sachs Sings, and she was so proud. <laughs> it was 15 minutes, you know, on <laughs> WEVD. Because one is certainly struck by, by reading your memoir show tunes uh, by wonderful, uh, with the huge influence of your mother, very positive. Very positive. She was a, a happy, a funny, uh, charming, and quite beautiful woman, and uh, she was the glamour figure that was kind of in my head for when, Mame, I, wrote, for her when I wrote Mame, and mm. and uh, because she was a party giver, and uh, mm. you know she 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 kind of symbolized all those great ladies that I've that I've been writing for. Interesting. Um, so you've got musical talent, um, certainly through the genes, I guess, from from her. But you're not a trained musician. I'm not. Did you, you no, no piano lessons, no theory, no. I, I took piano lessons, and the teacher ran out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> she said, "She said, Mrs. Herman, I don't know what to do with him. Uh, I was trying to learn the Happy Farmer, or you know, da da ba 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 ba, and she played it for me." Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I can do that. And I sat at the piano and played exactly what she played. I had never heard it before. Really? Just because I have that, that, year. Yeah. that gift, and that's a gift. That's nothing that uh, I deserve credit for. That's something that I was born with. And she said, I, he's not looking at the, at the music. He's playing it in a different key, mm. but he's playing the same the same song. <laughs> oh, God. Well, if you have the gift for the music, is it a gift you also have for the lyrics, or do the lyrics take you more effort, more blood, sweat, the Lyrics tears? are much more difficult to write, I think, for anyone mm -hmm. than, than, than music. But what has happened to me is that I think of them as one thing. I don't think of myself as a... As a, as a a man who writes poetry mm -hmm. or a man who writes music. I think of myself as a songwriter mm -hmm. because they happen simultaneously in my case. Mm. And um, and that's why you never sought a lyricist partner when you were starting out. Oh, no. Just when you would write a song, you would come up with the... Uh... In fact, the interesting uh, uh, truth is that I've received more Best Lyricist Awards than I have Best Composer Award. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Um, Milk and Honey was your first uh, yeah. successful uh, show. Puts a big smile on my face. It's a great, it has a great score. It's just I a charming score. I love the experience. And of course, my first Broadway show, and I was very young. Mm -hmm. yeah. How old were you when you did Oh, I was about 29, you mm -hmm. know. So it was, a, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. That first orchestra run through, you know, I had never heard my stuff played by anybody else but me. Mm -hmm. In all the off-Broadway reviews and everything, I was the piano player because we couldn't afford anything else. Right. And all of a sudden, I had these magnificent Hershey K arrangements, and I just sat there and wept through the whole thing. They must have thought I was a little <laughs> batty because I, 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 I had never heard my, my work played by a magnificent orchestra. Yeah. And everything about that experience was a first, you know. Mm -hmm. First uh, uh, experience working with three stars, Molly Pecan and Robert Weedy, who mm -hmm. was a major, you know, most happy fella sure, yeah. star. Yeah. And Mimi Benzel, a beautiful lady of, of, from the Met. And uh, 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 Albie Marr, a wonderful director who treated me with such respect that I thought this business is 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 is, is everybody's a doll. Everybody's, 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 everybody's a doll, <laughs> and it's going to be a barrel of you know. And this uh, was the first musical about Israel, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it did some, someone came to you and said, "I want a musical." A man named Jerry o Ostriker came to me and said, uh, "I want to do a musical about Israel," and I said, "I know everything about. It. I knew nothing about it, <laughs> but I." 
I, I, I was so excited about the idea of being offered, you sure, know, a, a musical Broadway that movie. I that I said I, I, I know everything about it, and he sent me to Israel. He put me on a plane with a book writer who I had never met, and the strange man is sitting next to me, and I said, "What are we going to do?" And he said, "Well, let's talk." And on the way, <laughs> we devised this uh, story idea about a group of widows who go to Israel and all, all the, uh, the uh, romantic uh, entanglements that, uh, that follow. And by the time we got off the plane, I knew that I had to write a song called Shalom. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Right. I knew <laughs> that that was going to be their introduction to sure. each other. Yeah. And that song began in my head, because I had no piano mm -hmm. in Israel, walking the streets of, of Israel, and it was a it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience to to create something from absolutely nothing but this man's idea. Right. I'm, I wonder if your training, because your songs are are very well constructed. I wonder if your training as an architect or designer influenced you in some way as a as a composer, just in the construction of a song, or even the construction of a show, because your shows are brilliantly constructed too. I do think that the two art forms are very similar mm. because they all use hundreds of different elements that have to come together to make one new thing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm designing a home, I have to think about the finished product before I go out and buy a sofa hmm. or before I find a paint chip. I have to know what that finished room is going to look like. And it's exactly the same with, with the musical. Really? So you see what MAME looks like I, before you start before writing Before you hire Angela Lansbury, right? I, yeah. knew, <laughs> <laughs> I knew what the Dolly number was going to look like. I had hoped that it would look like what it looked like. And then Gower Champion, God bless him, yeah. heard my, my, my vision of it and put it on the stage twice as effectively as what I told him. Mm. But I told him that I saw a, a, a film once early in my life called Lillian Russell with Alice Faye, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. and that she sang in a restaurant, mm. and the waiters joined her. And I said, they all had these white aprons on, and I said, I see Dolly coming down a staircase in flaming red, and the waiters, and I described this whole scene to him, and his eyes got like saucers, and then of course, a couple of months later, I saw that in front of my eyes in, in Detroit, and it was overwhelming because when you have a vision like that, you don't always end up seeing that on, on the stage, yeah. but I did with, with, with Gower. Uh, now, Hello, Dolly came after. Uh, milk, milk and Honey. Yeah. And, and it was, was it David Merrick who approached you, having seen Milk and Honey, and brought you into uh, Yes, and that's an Dolly? interesting story, because David Merrick kind of summoned me to his office, you know. <laughs> you, you just are told to arrive at David Merrick's office. As a decorator, what do you think of uh, his office? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> everything in the office was fire engine red. But I mean everything. And it was the most intimidating office I have ever walked into, and of course that was his ploy. You're right. Yeah. He wanted to sit there, and this man with a with a black black hair and black mustache and dark eyes, <laughs> looking kind of satanical, was sitting behind a desk, surrounded by all this red, and this young scared kid, and I really was. I was absolutely petrified of this man. Mm. Now, now, wasn't he a little worried because he thought you were an ethnic composer? <laughs> That's the first thing he said to yeah. me. He said, I saw your show and I think you're very talented, but I don't know if you're American enough. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't <laughs> say that to me. I had two parents who were teachers in the, the New York school system. I mean, I, mean, it, I, I said, American enough. I said, I said this was the departure. Right. The show. Well, Milk and Honey was the what departure. What you saw last night. I said there's nobody more apple pie and Abe Lincoln <laughs> than I am, and I and he looked at me skeptically, and I knew I had to prove it to him. Mm. So I said, Do you have any 
kind of material that I could look at. And he went to a shelf and he pulled out a, a little uh, script and it said on the cover, Matchmaker Draft Number One. Mm. It's my most precious uh, uh, possession. Uh, possession. Oh, you have it? Yeah. I have it. Mm. It's dog-eared now, but it's, <laughs> it's so precious to me because that's what I read that night until the wee hours, and I started to work on, on four songs. Really? What four songs did you work on? I wrote Put On Your Sunday Clothes exactly as you know it and exactly as it appeared in the show. Mm. I got so excited by the imagery of, of the period and, and the Thornton Wilder line that Mike Stewart had very wisely kept in his version mm. of, of this. Put on your Sunday clothes, Barnaby. We're going to New York. And ah. it just said That's everything it, yeah. to me. Yeah. And I knew that that was a song. And, I, and I, I started to think about horses' hooves. And I went, da dum ba dum bum 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 And that song just flew out. It, 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 it honestly flew out of me. It was frightening. Mm. Because I wanted this job, like the guy in chorus. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it so badly. And what other songs? And then I wrote um, the opening number. I wrote, I put my hand in because I wanted to settle with the audience what Dolly was about instantly. I, I, I didn't want them to have to get used to the fact that she was a busybody and that she mixed in everything, that she, her, that she fixed people up. Right. That was her right. you know, profession. So I wrote that. And I wrote Call on Dolly as a counterpoint to that. And then I wrote the whole dancing sequence because mm. there was a lovely section in the script where uh, Dolly taught Cornelius how to dance. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful moment. And I wrote that lovely waltz, and uh, it's and still when, one of my favorite How long songs. did it take you? When did you go back to David Merrick? Four days. Four later. days later. <laughs> Four of the four iconic songs from American theater. Not, o not only did I write the four songs, but I called my friend Alice Borden, mm -hmm. uh, a girl th who I, I had known since she was eight years old, and she had a lovely voice. And I knew she would do this for me because I had absolutely no money. And I knew I couldn't go hire a great singer. So I said, how would you like to learn a couple of things really fast and go with me to David Merrick's office. And she said, are you kidding? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, she got a job from it. Really? She, oh, good. She, she went in to stop the world. And Merrick loved the songs? He loved the songs, and he loved, I think, even more than the songs, the fact that I was able to do them that quickly. Yeah. Right, right. But what is amazing to me, Jerry, is that just to hear you, you know, how you conceived of um, put on your Sunday clothes and, and I put my hand in here thinking this is what I want to establish with, with this character. These are things I, I would think that someone who works in the musical theater would have to sort of develop over time, you know, trial and error, experimentation, these sort of basic rules of the writing musical. You seem to have grasped them instantly, I mean, when you were so young. I, I, I think that's part of the gift that I was given to to just know what to musicalize and what not to musicalize. That is as important as knowing how to do it. Mm -hmm. You can't. So so often I'll go to a to a show and I'll hear a song that I know is not the highlight of that scene, mm -hmm. and then the, the the great moment comes in the scene. And there's no song there. Mm. Mm. And I want to say, boy, you goofed. You, you know, you know. Yeah. You have to know what to what to, what to turn into music. What is the emotional high point of right. of, of the scene? Um, not to take away from your gift, but you you were saying you were twenty nine, about twenty nine at this point, and you had worked on shows for much of your life. And when did you start at, at camps in the summer, making shows for you people know, and creating? I'm glad you, you brought that up. My parents owned a children's camp. Mm. They, they, uh, they, they uh, left the teaching world at one point and uh, bought this beautiful uh, uh, children's camp in upstate New York. And when I became old enough, I did the shows. Mm -hmm. 
and we had a you know a, a little theater and and uh, and I would cut down uh, Oklahoma and Finian's Rainbow, <laughs> and I put on all these great classic shows, and you learn yes. so much yeah. from seeing how a, a great musical is constructed. Yeah. So I was taught by by the best. <laughs> you were <laughs> taught by Frank Lesser before you met him. They didn't know I was I was right, but you I were was working <laughs> to shape, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> taking taking liberties with their shows, but but you do do learn so much by by directing a show at that tender age. Well, that's very interesting that the whole I I I phenomenon of the of the summer camp, a lot of the great people of the American theater came out of the tradition of the summer camps where yeah, they the were the camp skills, yeah. directors and the and that's gone now. <laughs> Maybe it's, that's the reason why gone. our shows aren't as good <laughs> as they used to be. Oh, it was, it was wonderful. And of course, because my parents owned the camp, I could do anything I wanted. <laughs> I said to my father one, at one time, I need a scrim. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, what's a scrim? And I said, well, it's this gauzy curtain that you can see through it sometimes. And if you put light in front of it, you can't see it. And he didn't know what I was talking about, <laughs> but he, he let me buy a scrim. <laughs> and uh, uh, he was very good to me and, mm. uh, and very helpful. And of course, my mother was in heaven, because right. that's what she wanted me to do. By the way, it must have been a thrill for your uh, mother to uh, be there with you on the opening night of Milk and Honey, your uh, first. Uh, ah, she was not. No. She was not. That's right. That's the great tragedy of my life, that Ruth Herman never saw a Broadway show of mine. Never. And to this, to this moment, of course, I've gotten over uh, uh, the mourning period because right. it's a long time ago. Right. But when I, when I go to an opening night of mine and I realize that she, she never saw the fruit of, of, of all that, of that all she that gave love. to yeah. me, all that love and, 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 and expectation, it's, it's very hard. Yeah. But we would say your father was there. My father saw everything. Your beloved aunt and your grandmother was there. Was at the beginning. The my first. grandmother saw many of them. Yes. And my mother's sister, who was my darling aunt, uh, saw everything. And uh, but uh, it's it's very hard. But to, she lives on in the shows in some ways. I mean, oh, she is in those oh, shows. Oh, she's in all those shows. Yeah. <laughs> um, we we're just going to end this segment. We're having such a good time. Will you stay for uh, uh, another episode of uh, Theater Talk so we can for love. another fin week? We'll camp out on the floor. We'll camp out on the floor. You won't leave. Love. So we invite you to stay for uh, uh, next week. But you've got a show you're working on right now. Oh, show yes. tune up in Nyack. We'll talk I, more about it next week. But tell us. I am now. so excited about show tune. It is. A compilation of 40 of my songs, mm. beautifully and seamlessly put together by a man named Paul Gilger. Uh, and it has Donna McKechnie and Marty Vidnovic and uh, six very talented uh, 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 singers. And it's directed by a man named Joey McNeely. And oh, very good. He's very, good he's director. very, very yeah. talented. And it's playing in Nyack at the Helen Hayes Theater for only 18 performances. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I want everybody to know that it's there. It's really a special evening. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that and also about Miss Spectacular. Oh, yeah. And your collaboration with Tommy Toon in yeah. Vegas yeah. Uh, next week here on Theater Talk. So. Great. Now that you've told him he's the grandfather of it, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting an opening night invitation in Vegas, Jerry. All right. <laughs> Jerry Herman, uh, thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Uh, Jerry, you said to put on your Sunday clothes just flowed right out of you. Can you, can you show us how that happened? It, <laughs> I started with... Uh, uh, just thinking about the sound of horses' hooves in, 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 in 1890. <laughs> and... Put on your Sunday clothes when you feel down and out. Strut down the street and have your picture took. Dressed like a dream, your spirits seem to turn about. That Sunday shine is a certain sign that you feel as fine as you look.
Beautiful. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night. Jerry Lewis has been entertaining audiences all over the world since he was a little teeny boy. And he's still a little teeny boy. Uh, he's a comedian, actor, a director, and he's been awarded, I'm sure most of you know, two of France's most prestigious awards, Commander of Arts and Letters and the Legion of Honor. Mm -hmm. And his latest movie with Madeleine Kahn called Slapstick of Another Kind opens Friday, March the 24th. Would you welcome Jerry Lewis? <laughs> a grown man and a grandfather <laughs> a grandfather. and not a child and I thought you would come out after that distinguished introduction kind of laid back and cool and you come out with hell but yeah because I get letters when I do laid back and cool with you really yeah last time we did the show I was laid back and cool and people write it's a confusion we're used to the craziness yeah and when you talk regular it's like another person you see what I'm Della? <laughs> Boy, you, you, things have changed for you the last few years, haven't you? Yeah. I have not seen you, haven't you? Things have changed, haven't they? Haven't they? Two, three, three four. four. And oh. anyway... <laughs> <laughs> this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on! <laughs> Obviously, this is what got you the award in France. I mean... <laughs> We like that very much when he does that. And he should certainly get the order of the commander or... The... So, let me ask you something. Do you get a pension with this award? I mean, is it like a, a, a government pension? No. But, I mean, those are prestigious awards. I'm not joking. The oh, commander yeah. of ours and the Legion of Honor. Legion of Honor. And you, this is... That's the Legion of Honor there. The, uh, the man that got the Legion of Honor first was Shorty. Napoleon. He got it first. Okay? Now, he is a he great... He never had an act. No, no, no. <laughs> he wasn't in show business. Oh, I was at Napoleon. Pool. Okay. He gets the award because he's a great general. Now you have Emil Zola, a great scientist. Right. You have Dr. Jonas Salt, a great researcher. Right. You have Madame Curie, a great pathologist. And now you get Jerry Lewis for doing... <laughs> <laughs> Madame Curie did that when she discovered radium. <laughs> in the dish it's glowing <laughs> what uh, what was it like over there what now what what does the actual function entail um this is obviously a luncheon or something no a dinner a dinner <laughs> it's a nobel prize get a, a luncheon <laughs> this is... no it's a dinner first you go to the ballet at the opera house and rudolf nuryev dedicates the entire ballet to you and you sit for three hours, and they do this wonderful ballet, uh -huh. and you can get a broken tuchus. Yes, yes. Sitting <laughs> but that is not, that goes with the award. That goes with the award. Then after the after the ballet, you uh, retire to the grill area in the opera house, where no, they like a, a luncheonette. I mean, no, it's for dinner. Well, Will you pay attention? Certainly. For Christ's sake, the grill. You mean to a show? You're talking about. <laughs> You're talking about a grill, where they... No, it's a place where people sit and eat. I understand. We go in there and we eat. Oh, really? And we're dressed with black tie and we're eating. It's right. nighttime, all right? Will you forget lunch? Got that. <laughs> what the... you go through, my God. Ballet. Ballet, then right to the grill. Will you listen?
Jackson? Yes, all right, then to the grill. Th no, it's a dining place the dining, the dining for place. eating. All right. Um, um, um. <laughs> then the president of France and the Nobel Peace Prize winner makes the presentation of Légion d'honneur, the Legion of Honor, which is equivalent to our Congressional Medal of Honor. Well, that is, that's, that's something. Very high that's up. That's something. Exactly. I, I make fun. Then I suppose there's... there's <laughs> is there dancing after that? I mean, is it... Yeah, we dipped. I make, I make fun, but that's why I get paid. Yes, to, I understand To jest, that. to jest. And jesting, you've been doing very well. Jesting is my life. You moved me right off Tuesdays. the front page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Well, you, you, I have a message for you from Sinatra. Yes. He sends the... For grand thanks. <laughs> Knocking Both him of off us, the front yes. page. <laughs> yeah. Now, Lee, you've, uh, in, the, in the last two or three years, <laughs> we, uh, you have, not we, <laughs> I, uh, you had quadruple bypass surgery, right? Double, John. It was a double bypass. A double bypass. Yeah. What? He had it twice. Freddie says you had it twice. A yeah. Double bypass. <laughs> <laughs> no. I just, Why did I? Why Once. did I think it was a quadruple? Well, a press. It sounds better. Yeah. Quadruple yeah. sounds better, but you still have to get the black and decker to open you up. <laughs> oh yeah, and then like 12 inches with the retractors, and they go in and they they take an artery out of your leg and they graft it to the heart. <laughs> but you, I've never seen you look as well. I feel marvelous. You, you I tell you the big secret. I. Just don't go to Wendy's. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Will you wait a minute? You're as bad as he is. It's just that it's junk food, and I ate it all my life, and it's okay for people who want to do that. But now, after you have this kind of an operation, you have salads, and you eat chicken, and you watch your diet. And after 43 years of smoking four packs a day, I, I don't smoke anything. I don't put anything uh, in my body. What was your typical thing? Typical breakfast. What would you normally have that you don't have anymore? A slice of toast and a cup of coffee. Nice for thing. lunch, I have a salad. And for dinner, I'll have either fish or chicken. It's six to 700 calories a day. And you feel comfortable with that? I feel wonderful. You don't miss all the trashing? The throwing up annoys me, but... Yes, of uh, course. <laughs> you pay for your thrills, naturally. <laughs> However, hey, we like that. <laughs> we we'll, uh, have the this brief message that you have to say to me for what you have to say. How do you know? How do you know? Le croc, c'est le bubu. Oh, no. Ah, excuse me? Oui. Si de moi, quand c'est bon. Le croc, c'est le sponsor. Je le prends. Vous êtes qui? Elle est trois minutes. Small one. Je dois. Je dois. En suivi. <laughs> we shall be back in a moment for the second award of the evening. I have learned not to believe everything I read in, in the tabloids. And yet I have read. <laughs> yes. I read that you were going to move to France permanently. Now, that's not true, is it? No. Okay. I would never leave this country. I bought some property in France, and I'm going to build there. Oh. But uh, I spent so much time in here. here no, a grill. <laughs> you did buy a little, uh... Yes. Yeah. A little place, and, uh, I'm going back next week to start a film again. We'll shoot six weeks in, uh, Paris and five weeks in, uh, Tunisia. Yeah. And you got married the last year? Yeah. Yeah. A year and a month ago. Nice yeah. lady. That's nice. And Slapstick is, uh, a very special film. Oh, that's Madeline, with Madeline Kahn? Yeah. Oh. Well, you know the sense of humor, Madeline. She's a bright, funny lady. Great, great, great comic actress. And we had such fun. We play seven-foot, two-inch twins. <laughs> I come from another place. We have confrontations with two-inch twins. <laughs> and that's Kurt Vonnegut. You know, he's pretty right. pretty off the wall. Can I show Is this a, yes, is this that's, a picture? Yes, that's from? a picture of the... Uh, 
prosthetics and the uh, outfits of Madeline. Oh, you, I wouldn't have not recognize either one of you. And we play our own parents in the film as well. Look at that. Take a whole shot. I mean, those two people should be put to sleep. You are on the... <laughs> you are on the right there, are you? I'm on the right, oh, yeah, huh? John. Yeah. Well, I'm... Uh, Madeline, I didn't mean anything, you know, personally. Yeah, of by course. That. It's quite a... That's a lot of makeup, isn't it? Oh, yes. Two and a half, three hours every morning. Those prosthetics are unbelievable because there's pulsations in the head and in the eyes. Is that the way they do it on those horror films? Where yeah. Uh... Yeah. They're little pulsation tubes that are... They force air from the back. Right. And... Every time the two kids are together, there's, it's a really lovely love story between the brother and the sister. And uh, whenever they're together, the pulsation means that their minds, the genius in the two kids are working. Right. Vonnegut slaps it was a marvelous book. I didn't believe it could be brought to the screen. Yeah. We have, a, we have a film clip. I suppose you know that. Yes. Uh. <laughs> are you going to keep it? Yeah. <laughs> I just want you to know we have it. Oh, good. I'm glad. We unfortunately don't have time to show oh, it. Oh, well, that's probably no, all right. We I, can, I, I can act it out. Oh, we have time to show it. Oh, okay. Uh, is, do we have to know anything about this? Yeah, it should be set up. But we couldn't get anyone to come on and do that. To do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, is there a particular moment in the picture that... Marty should... Feldman plays the wicked butler. And it's a scene with Marty Feldman and the children. Okay. Introducing the children to their parents for the first time in 15 years. All right. Here is... Uh... A short excerpt. So proud. Well, then. Without further ado, may I present Master Wilbur and Mistress Eliza. nation in the whole world. Please, God, let me faint. Me can I please faint? Me too. Come on, kids. You can do better than this. I want you to give them a welcome. They will never forget. It is. It's very, it's very unusual, and it's, it's uh, amazing that this young Wunderkin, Stephen Paul, right. brought it to the screen. He did a hell of a job. Yeah, when does this come out? It opens in Los Angeles Friday, right, opens around right. the country thereafter. Okay, good luck with it. Thank you. That's, that, that's fascinating. Oh, I've got to tell you something. Do I have a minute sure. to tell John about sure. the makeup? The prosthetics are put on in the morning. I'll do it very quickly. The prosthetics are put on in the morning, and there's phony teeth that Madeline and I wore to give us pr protrusion, right? They call me on the set the first day, and we only had one set of teeth, okay, John? One set of teeth. The dentist is delivering more during the course of the week. You know, it's dangerous making a film with one anything. You always have to have a backup. Right. We didn't have a backup. They called me. I can't find the teeth in my trailer. It's a 40-foot trailer. We're now under the bunks, into the refrigerator, looking for the teeth. I got a whole crew waiting. My little Shih Tzu is in the motorhome. That's a dog for people That's who don't That's my know little that, yeah. puppy, Angel, my little Shih Tzu. We're looking for the teeth, and it's a good thing I had a camera, because in the corner of the motorhome, we finally saw where the teeth were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's funny>. So... <laughs> You must always have a camera handy. That's Answer. why I was just named national chairman of Photo Week, May 7th through May 13th. <laughs> That's a funny picture. Isn't that That's funny? funny picture? Will you give that to Charlie for me? 
you ever learn to speak French? You spend so much time over there. It's. I know when we're, we're kidding around yeah. here, a lot of phonetic stuff is going I on. I can when I'm there, Johnny. I really can. You I understand it. it. I can speak it. I leave there and I can't. I really can't. You get in the rhythm when you're over there. I you understand hear... what they're saying and I relate to it and then I can use the language and it works. Ah. It really does. Okay. Nous revions. You put a Z in everything. That microphone, and this man here sit, and I am in that chair, that audience, capital tour. And they understand. We will be back in a moment. I hope so. We're yes. Telling something. Yes. I found out, and Jerry didn't ask me to mention this, but you were also nominated by the British film industry for a supporting role, right? King of Comedy, yeah. In King of Comedy. Academy Awards are March 25th. We'll yeah, that's find out. amazing. Did Freddie, uh, Freddie was in that picture with you. Freddie was in King I of Comedy. I was nominated. I didn't win. Ah, oh, well, that's too bad. 